Although Humphrey Bogart and Ingrid Bergman have long since departed from Casablanca, Morocco continues to entice the adventure traveler with its legendary sense of the exotic. Hi folks, I'm Angelo Viola. On today's Outdoor Journal, I'm going to experience a, an adventure trip into culture, a culture that can trace its roots back to 1200 BC. Perfumed with legends of the Arabian Nights, Morocco offers a riveting series of sometimes medieval images. But don't adjust your calendar, folks. This is definitely the 90s. And although the unspoken social and cultural rules are somewhat different than what we're accustomed to, I think you'll find today's program absolutely fascinating. On today's Surviving the Outdoors, Reno comes to us from sunny Mexico, where he's taking in some sunshine. Reno? Edge, today we're going to be talking about UVA and UVB, what those terms mean, the sun, and how it can be your friend or your foe. Sounds like an interesting piece, Reno. Now let's move to Venezuela for this week's Off the Beaten Path report with Pete Bowman. Okay, hold it just a second, buddy. Hold it just a second. Ha! Beautiful. I can't get enough of myself. Seriously though, buddy, a key to taking really good outdoor pictures is composition. And that's what I'm going to deal with today. Putting whatever you're shooting in the right spot. Yeah, right, Pete. I think one of the best things you can do to improve your photography is to get a new subject. Well, here's looking at you, kid. It's time for this week's Outdoor Journal. The Outdoor Journal. Brought to you by GM GoodWrench Service Plus. Expert service, honest prices. Chevy the most dependable, longest-lasting trucks. And Mitchell, the antiperspirant that's so effective, you can even skip a day. This may look like a movie set to you, but in fact, casbahs like this is where the Moroccans live today and always have. See this alleyway behind me? It's quite possible that it witnessed the Berbers ambushing the Roman legions over 2,000 years ago. Morocco's past reads like an epic saga. Scattered and politically disorganized tribes of fierce warriors that anthropologists called Berbers occupied this part of North Africa since the beginning of history but where they originally came from still remains a mystery. Now the Berbers, or Moors as the Romans called them, represent about 35% of Morocco's population. Their lineage is deeply entrenched in the Moroccan culture, and nowhere is that more evident than in its architecture. The most remarkable characteristic of the Berber style is the way that it's survived with few adaptations over the centuries. With vertical surfaces covered in geometric designs such as lozenges, chevrons, crosses, and triangles, the Berber architecture of sun-dried bricks and horseshoe arches has maintained its integrity and is alive and doing well. The artisan's skills have been handed down throughout countless generations, and today major centers like Tangier, Casablanca, Marrakesh, and Agadir have captured the perfect blend of the ancient and the modern, as evidenced in today's bold new Morocco. But outside of these major centers, there are thousands of original Berber structures still being used as homes by tribespeople who carry on the endless tradition of the ancient ones. Although part of Morocco's allure stems from timeless customs and rituals, the methods of reaching it are among the most modern in the world. Of the exotic lands in the Middle East and Africa, it's by far the most accessible. Several flights per week connect this magnificent country with the Western world through the airline of the kingdom, Royal Air Maroc. It's one of the reasons why this relatively small country boasts the most sophisticated air transportation system in the Arab world. This in turn has led to the development of the best rubber tire travel network in Africa. 
highways which so far are still relatively uncongested. This elaborate first-class road system has almost 12,000 kilometers or 20,000 miles of paved primary roads, 9,000 kilometers or 15,000 miles of secondary unpaved motor trails, making the country completely accessible from the northwestern side of the Atlas Mountains to the southeastern sub-Sahara regions. Now even though domestic air travel between the major cities is quite elaborate, the essence of Morocco can only truly be captured when traveling by road. The vistas are truly breathtaking. Not to mention the opportunity to stop and experience some of the local flavor at the many roadside bazaars that are part of the Moroccan way. Cubicles like this will soon be filled with merchants as the market opens for another day. The souks, as they're called locally, are more than just a place to buy a product. They're the actual social hub of this fascinating culture. Now this week, Surviving the Outdoors. Our flight destination is Acapulco, Mexico. There are no mandatory vaccinations for entry into Mexico and most tourists simply require proof of citizenship accompanied by a photo identification and a tourist card, which is usually issued through your travel agent. Unit of currency is the peso. Located on the Pacific coast, Acapulco is a beachcomber's delight and just as Mexico is famous for its silver, its sunny, hot beaches also make it renowned for its bronze. Peak tour season is December through March. Ah, look at that surf. Of course, the sun and the beach. Hi, everyone. What do we as outdoors people share? Well, of course, it's the weather, but more specifically, the sun. And today I'm in one of the warmest places on earth to get the heat on sun protection, if you will. We used to think that having a tan was a healthy thing. But in reality, it can be a health hazard. And today, we're going to try and simplify the terms that have to do with sun tanning, things like UVA, UVB, SPF, and so on. Generally, sun rays are classified into two groups. One is good, the other bad. Both are ultraviolet, and both can cause damage. UVB radiation is the most powerful and potentially harmful. And if you think in terms of B standing for burn, you'll get the idea. It usually attacks the outer layers of skin and does all the damage. Nasty stuff. UVA, on the other hand, is not as destructive, but penetrates deeper into your skin. If you think of this one as A for aging, it will help remind you to protect yourself better for the long term. Don't make a mistake about B. Even though it's not as bad, it's the one that causes a tan and eventually the one that causes cancer. So, how do you protect yourself? Well, actually, there are several ways, but there's more you're going to need to know about sunscreen and sunblocks. When you think in terms of sunblock, you need to consider all of your options. Hats are the number one piece of protection that you should use. This item protects one of the most delicate areas, which includes some of the most sensitive and lightest skin on your body. Get a hat that offers protection and has a wide brim, or better yet, one that offers protection all around your head. To prevent those rays from getting to your ears and the back of your neck. Don't forget those reflective surfaces like water and snow, as they can redirect 80% of the light right back into those areas that you already have shaded. The right clothing will also help prevent burns and skin cancer. Almost all clothing provides some protection from solar radiation. The material acts as a physical block to prevent UV rays from penetrating the skin. However, the amount of protection will be directly related to the tightness of the weave of the cloth. Bear in mind that as fabric gets wet, it also loses some of its ability to block UV rays since the fabric becomes more transparent and allows more light to penetrate through to the skin. There are some new products on the market today that are called sun veils. These garments are mesh-like and lightweight. They offer the same kind of sun blocking that your sheer curtains offer the inside of your house. The type of weave is the secret here, and it seems to work well in blocking most of those harmful rays. Now let's focus on shade. The sun is most dangerous between 11 a.m. and 4 p.m. The rule of thumb is to be extra careful when your shadow is shorter than you are. Shade is easy to decipher. The darker the area, the more complete your protection. Things like trees, umbrellas, and overhead protection are worth their weight in gold, or bronze in this particular instance. Use the shade effectively and keep on moving as it does. The outdoors can be a highly dangerous radiation area if you're not careful, but your choice of protection will help you avoid those nasty burns. Remember, there is nothing that is a total sunblock 
The next best thing are sunscreens. And there's definitely things you're gonna to need to know about them as well. Most reputable sunscreens will have an SPF number on the label. And this is your way of knowing how much protection you're getting. These protective numbers range from two to 45 and simply are the screen protection factor which is applicable to your sunscreen. So what does all of this mean? In simple terms, if you normally burn in 10 minutes without sunscreen, then an SPF 15 will mean that you'll burn in about 150 minutes. But that's just an approximate way for you to try and figure out how long you have until you burn, especially in the higher numbers. In reality, the length of time that you can stay in the sun while wearing an SPF 15 depends on your skin sensitivity to burning. The SPF number doesn't specifically relate to actual minutes, but rather expresses a multiplication factor for length of protection from the sun according to your skin type. For instance, on my skin type, an SPF 30 would give me about 30 times longer than my burn time, which is actually 10 minutes. Therefore, I'd get about 300 minutes of protection. That's right, five hours of hassle-free sun time. Don't be fooled, however, as these are just factor numbers based on perfect conditions, such as not sweating the lotion off, or that the sun is only as hot as your previous burn. Every day, the SPF number will mean something a little different. In general, a good rule of thumb is to determine your burn time, like I have, which is about 10 minutes without any protection, then choose an SPF number that's suited for your expected length of stay in the outdoors. Let's use an SPF 45 for this example. The theory is that 10 minutes of burn time times 45, which is a sun protection factor, should give me about 450 minutes or seven and a half hours of protection. But the reality is that it simply won't last that long because of body movement, sweating, telling off, etc., etc. So you'll have to make certain decisions on the spot as to how much protection to use. For most of us, a warm sunny day outdoors is part of what makes life worth living. Learning how to balance the risks with the pleasures will help us avoid the dangers of UVA and UVB rays. So keep in mind the five S's of sun protection. If you're out in the sun, seek shade, slip on a shirt, slap on a hat, and slop on some sunscreen, SPF 15 or higher. Oh, she is gonna be a hot one today. Now this copper tone sport with an SPF factor of 30 seems to work just fine for me and my type of skin. And it should give me about four or five hours to enjoy this great beach without having to worry about UVAs or UVBs. Here in the middle of the Sahara Desert, or here in a luxurious resort like the Veltour in Agadir, scenes like the one behind me are commonplace, but they're not just show. In fact, their roots date back to 40 AD when the Berbers were rulers of this part of Africa. Even if you're not into history, Morocco's fascinating and storied past captures your imagination like a Hemingway novel. Woven into the very fiber of Moroccan culture is the conflicting influences that have washed up against this northwestern corner of Africa. You see, for almost 5,000 years, the Moroccans have managed to triumph against all attempts at conquest. The Phoenicians, the Romans, the Egyptians, the Spanish, the Arabs, and the French. Each one of these powerful civilizations came, mingled, and left a very special imprint on the Berbers. But to truly experience the heady Moroccan lifestyle, you have to spend some time at one of the countless souks, or bazaars. From the moment you enter, you're consumed by adventure. You see, when making a purchase at the bazaar, arguing prices is almost mandatory. It's Moroccan tradition. The customer's refusal to purchase and the vendor's sob story about being driven to bankruptcy are all part of the ritual exchange that has been going on and taking place here for thousands of years. To make a purchase without it is unthinkable. Here you'll find anything from rosewood figurines to exotic spices, from hand-worked silver to Berber jewelry, and of course, as in the case throughout most of Morocco, dancing, singing, and storytelling. This may look like a mishmash of dancing and singing, but actually each one of the members of the troupe is telling a story about his own village. Now let's have a look at this week's Off the Beaten Path report.
Our flight destination is Caracas, Venezuela's capital city. There are no mandatory vaccinations for entry into Venezuela, and most tourists visiting Venezuela need only a valid passport. The unit of currency is the Bolivar. For a range of geographical spectacles in a small, accessible area, no South American country can match Venezuela. With its phenomenal scenery, this was a photographer's paradise. The peak tour season is July and August. You've got horizons, you've got the rule of thirds, you've got foreground elements, you've got horizontals, you've got verticals, and the list goes on and on. These are all elements that either make or break a good outdoor shot. Now, whether you're the, uh, the point and shoot type of person that grabs a little camera, or the advanced enthusiast who grabs one of these big boys and sets it all up nice, the end result is still the same. A good picture is a good one, and a bad one is a bad one. Now, I, by all means, am not a professional photographer. I'm not even close to a professional photographer, but I have taken a few beauties in my day, and I feel very satisfied about them. Whether you take landscape, people, or wildlife photos outdoors, the common bond between them is they're pleasing to the eye if they're shot properly. With so many variables like proper shutter speed for a fast-moving subject, depth of field for a fully focused picture from front to back, select focusing, ensuring only a certain part of the picture is razor sharp, panning techniques for special effects, to exposure compensation, making sure those whites really do come out white, a person can really become confused with photography techniques. Make sure you keep it as simple as you want. Are you working? The camera equipment's working well, hope I can. We, that's you and I folks, are very fortunate today to have the assistance of a professional cameraman. Uh, did I say professional? Well, I think it's supposed to be making me look good. To show us the do's and the don'ts to make a good photograph. Which brings me to my first point, the rule of thirds. I'll bet you that 90% of the really good photos you've ever seen have the main subject either off to one side, off to the other. It's maybe a little lower, it's maybe a little higher. It's definitely not in the center. This system works and it works well. It's all a matter of how the brain perceives that shot. Today I'm gonna to deal with only three composition rules, the ones you really should concentrate on. And the most important, in my opinion, is the rule of thirds. Simply dissect your viewfinder into four lines, two vertically and two horizontally. It looks like the old tic-tac-toe grid. These lines and the areas they intersect are called power points and subject placement here can make all the difference in the world. As you can see here, the road is on one power line, the horizon is on another power line, and the sign is stuck perfectly into a power point. I know it's really easy to place everything dead on in a man-made picture like this one, but the rule works. Use it as best you can. Now these power points aren't always necessary, but they usually do work. Let's take a quick look at how you use it. Put me in the center of this photograph. It's all right, it's the way everybody shoots. It's all right, it works somewhat, but it's not as good as it could be. Put me off to one side now, and it starts to add some interest. That's one of the side grid lines. Uh, have you look at out of that photo, again, it's not working too well, but if you, if you just turn your subject this way a little bit, all of a sudden there's a lot of interest. Same thing if we go to the other side. It's exactly the same. Look out of it, it's not so good. Look into it just a bit, and it seems to add some interest. Gives you lots of elements over here, plus the subject, better picture. You can do the same thing with the, the top and bottom grid lines too. If this subject doesn't work, but if the subject warrants it, it'll, it'll add a lot of interest. Now, speaking of those horizon lines, the old dreaded horizon, what about that? We've all seen pictures of the crooked horizon. It is not a pretty sight. It could be bang on exposure, colors like you've never seen before in your life, saturation perfect, everything done like dinner, except that horizon is gone and so is that picture. It's an absolute important element. Now, along the horizon line talk, the horizon line should never be in the center of a photo. Bring it up a little bit or bring it down a little bit. For most of the common subjects that everyday picture takers shoot, when a horizon is involved, dead center placement can actually hurt the end result. The rare exception might be a reflection in the water or something that needs equal balance. Otherwise, move the horizon either down. In this case, I'd like more clouds or sun filling the sky. Or move the horizon up filling the whole shot with elements. A sense of imbalance, simply put, looks better. 
None of that word horizons comes the word horizontal. Do we shoot horizontally this way or vertically this way? Well, the rule is really easy. If you have an elongated subject like these avocados, let's say, it's sort of an up and down subject. That warrants a vertical shot. Up and down, crop it properly, it'll look better that way. Now, take this subject like this little cluster of flowers. It's not the most beautiful thing in the world, but if you're gonna shoot that, it's low to the ground, it's wide, that takes more of a horizontal shot. It, it adds that element of wideness to it. I'll guarantee you one thing though, folks. You are not taking enough vertical shots. If I see your package of pictures come back, I'll bet you 80, 90, maybe 100% are all flat like this. You gotta start shooting vertically. At least double the amount you're shooting now is probably still enough. Now we've got good rules, like the rule of thirds. We've got composition galore here, horizontals, verticals, horizons. One other key element in photographs, keep your eyes open. Always look for something that nobody else will find. I don't know how many people probably walked past this subject right here. I don't know how pretty that looks to you, but to me that has got character in it. And I am gonna take this shot and be very happy with it. Okay, we got a horizontal for sure, it's long. Okay, the rule of thirds, I got it down a little bit in the bottom. We got a beauty. Up until recent times, the camel has been the single most important means of transportation in this part of the world. In fact, even today it plays a major role here in Morocco. So I guess it's only fitting that I take a trip back in time across these sand dunes on old Betsy here. Bit, bit, bit. Let's go guys, shall we? Here we go, gentlemen. <laughs> Morocco is often referred to as an island surrounded by three seas. The seas of the Atlantic, the seas of the Mediterranean, and the sand sea of the Sahara. That's probably why they call this rather ugly creature the ship of the desert. Although camels can be found throughout this land, as they graze along roadsides in and around most Moroccan cities, the real home for this strange creature lies on the outskirts of the Sahara Desert. There is no question that this remarkably homely creature was definitely built for this country, or vice versa. This camel riding stuff is tough. Come on, get up. Come on, get up. Get on up there. Throughout the shooting of this episode, I've had a difficult time reminding myself that, in fact, we are in the late 20th century. It's hard to believe that a country that uh, functions so well in the modern world is able to maintain this rich heritage and culture. For the Outdoor Journal, I'm Angelo Viola from somewhere in the deserts of Morocco. Bislama. Easy, guys. Easy. <laughs>